What does it mean to you? You have to have the ability when you when it comes to discipline, it's like you have to sacrifice loved ones. <laughs> <laughs> you have to sacrifice loved ones for a long period of time if you want to be great. Welcome to this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast, episode nine. 52 this is actually episode 952 need to change that of the real deal podcast i hope everybody out there is having a great week a great evening themes going out like barry sanders who will discuss the spectacular and legendary career of one aaron donald later on in the podcast but as usual we will begin the podcast with a deep dive justin fields of course uh, was this past weekend was traded to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, Chicago will get a six round pick for him, um, traded for a six round pick if he starts over fifty one percent of his of this of the snaps. Then that will be upgraded to a fourth round pick. So just to show you that Chicago thought nothing, if anything at all, uh, about Justin Fields. Um, Okay, let me, so I'll begin with the, uh, first of all, to me, this is an absolute slam dunk for the Pittsburgh Steelers, okay, even if it conveys to a fourth-round pick. I don't trust at all the Chicago Bears when it comes to quarterback um, assessing. Like, we don't know what Justin Fields, like, you, you can't call Justin Fields a bust, okay? He was the 11th pick. In the draft in uh, what 2020, let's we'll say 2022, uh, yeah, 2022 or 2021, I believe it was 22, um, 11th pick, excuse me, or 21. And no, no franchise in the NFL, very few franchises in the NFL have been poorly, like, have been as poorly run, um, than the Chicago Bears. They are, they've been an absolute shit show. Uh, again, I don't, they, you know, <laughs> and I'll get to the Bears, but I, I don't trust the, the Chicago Bears at all uh, from that standpoint. And, you know, to me, this is going to be a one-sided trade from the standpoint of you trade Justin Fields, you're going to draft Caleb Williams, and you're going to get the shit, Caleb Williams is going to get the shit beat up, uh, kicked out, kicked he was drafted in 21. So Fields was drafted in 21, the 11 pick. Keller Williams is going to get the shit kicked out of him playing behind that offensive line, playing um, with the organization that has been inept in not only drafting, but developing quarterbacks over basically for their entire history. Like the Bears, they just despite their rich history and uh, being one of the blue bloods in the NFL, they haven't had quarterbacks have just not been their thing for whatever reason. Really hard to, you know, fathom how poorly they've done in terms of drafting and developing quarterbacks, but that's just it is just one of those things. So I completely I listen, I think Justin Fields has has a lot of talent. We know the raw athletic ability he has as a runner. Um they, you know, he's not a big quarterback, so he cannot like Lamar Jackson, you know, he can't keep taking these hits. And eventually, you have to develop him as a, you know, not a pure pocket passer, but as somebody who can throw from the pocket. Because he's already had some injury issues with how many hits he's had to endure playing uh, the style, the reckless style that he plays uh, with being a primary primary runner. Uh, you can make a case that he is arguably the best running quarterback in the league, even over Lamar Jackson. But guess what? What does that get you? It gets you, you know, missing four to five games a year and it gets you probably a five to eight year career instead of a 10 to 12 or 12 to 13, 14 year career. So there's that style of play uh, for Justin Fields. It's just not, you know, it's not sustainable at all. So he goes to an organization in Pittsburgh that is not what they once were. They're not what they once were, but they have some adults in the room. And the most important adult that they will have in the room, of course, is one Mike Tomlin. And if you think that 
Fields is not going to eventually be the starting quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers, then you're just not paying attention. Um, Russell Wilson may start the season as a starter. Fields will they Pittsburgh traded for Fields, thinking that this guy will eventually develop and be to, to be in the starter. You don't trade for Justin Fields if you have that much confidence in Russell Wilson. The reason why they picked up Russell Wilson, as we discussed it last week, was they for you. I mean, one point two million dollars. If you can get Russell Wilson for one point two two million dollars for one year, then it's it's kind of one of those things that you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. If he's bad, you can cut him or bench him and keep him moving. But they're getting Justin Fields. Justin Fields is is the future for them in their minds. They're not public, publicly publicly going to say it, but you know, twenty five years old. Um, you get him out of a horrible situation. You put some nice pieces around him with a running game. This where we know can draft receivers. They know how to build an offensive line, and they know they know how to coach quarterbacks uh, over the course of their of their history. They've they I mean, you know, they've gone to, listen. They went to the Super Bowl with Neil O'Donnell as a quarterback, right? They went to a, they were going to a conference championship with Cordell Stewart, right? They've been in the playoffs with the guys like Tommy Maddox. This is an organization that knows how to coach quarterbacks and knows how to get the most out of quarterbacks and knows how to build their roster around quarterbacks. So, I don't, again, this is a no, absolute no-brainer for Pittsburgh. I expect Justin Fields will be the starter before summer is over. Like before October, I would expect him to be the starter. Um, no problem with having him, with having him back up uh, Russell Wilson initially, but that won't last long. It won't. As far as the Bears goes, listen, the Bears are the Bears. Um, to me, what would have made the most sense would would be to keep Fields, have him start, have drive up his value. Have Caleb Williams sit a year, and then trade him next off season. Like that to me would have made the most sense. I have no problem with them wanting Caleb Williams. First of all, I don't think. I mean, I, I listen. Caleb Williams is the number one prospect. He's going to be the number one quarterback taken. He's going to be the number one player taken. Very good player. He's not a second coming. Like this, he's not a can't miss uh, prospect. He's not Andrew Luck. He's not Peyton Manning. Um, he, you know, he's not on that level as far as the NFL prospect. Very good player. But I I think, you know, teams are going to be chasing these quarterbacks. I, I think that he, in this circumstance, it, it has a chance to go left very quickly. We've seen teams ruin quarterbacks, no matter how much, how talented they are. Andrew Luck was ruined by the Indianapolis Colts because he took too many hits. David Carr was ruined back in the day by the Houston Texans because he took too many hits. And to me, I've never seen a situation where a quarterback sat a year and it hurt that and it hurt that player. Aaron Rodgers played behind Brett Favre. End up is going to end up being one of the all time greats. Steve Young played behind Joe Montana. All-time great. Okay. I've never get, I've never seen a quarterback be hurt by sitting a year or two. Never. So, they're going to throw Caleb Williams into the, into the lion's den, and he's going to absolutely get, like I said, he's going to get annihilated playing, uh, playing uh, with that franchise with that offensive line, with just that entire, that culture of losing that they had. And by the way, I don't care if Justin Fields, like, would have had to add to as far as the trade speculation. Like, that's not like, you you know, I don't care if he unfollowed you and all that. It's not, he's not going to destroy the locker room because of the trade speculation or the rule or the, the constant rumors of being traded. But you can tell the Bears absolutely 
just wanted him in essence off the team. And how about the Bears? How about this? Right, this detail. These, this came out later, early. This came out like Monday in terms of the details of the trade. How about the ideal that the Bears would allow Justin Fields to, in essence, dictate where he wanted to go? Not so much getting the best deal, but we're going to do you a solid and trade you to a place where you want to be at. That's not how, like, do you see Danny Ainge doing that in the, in the NBA? Do you see any general manager worth their while doing, like, trading the player where they want to go instead of getting the best deal? Yeah, Phoenix wanted to go, like, Kevin Durant wanted to go to Phoenix, but also the Nets absolutely got the best deal possible as far as draft picks and compensation. See Sam Presley from Oklahoma City not getting the most compensation and trying to do the player a solid? Like, no. That's not, that's, that's not what we're doing here. We're going to get you the best. We're going to do what's, what's best in for our organization, not for you. You've been here for a cup of coffee. Why, why would there be any loyalty to doing Justin Fields a solid? You clearly don't want him. So, I, again, I don't understand. I don't understand it. Like, there should have been a number of teams lined up for a 25-year-old quarterback with the, type of, with the type of talent that Justin Fields has, has and the type of potential that he has. You limit yourself to what? The Just the Steelers? Because he wanted to play because he wanted to play for Pittsburgh? Sure, great for the Steelers, great for Justin Fields, but what about the Chicago? What about you, the Chicago Bears? You're telling me... I really think if they if they could have if they would have done their that was in their best interest as the organization that they could have got a third round pick possibly possibly if 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 incentives and he played a lot of snaps maybe that goes into being a second round pick. You know I mean, horrible quarterback. You know how bad quarterbacking is in the NFL right now. Even the potential of somebody like Justin Fields has value. But that's the Bears. I mean, the Bears are an ass backwards organization. They don't have a clue what they're doing. And again, anybody, any quarterback that plays that that's playing in the organization or that, that's playing a part of that organization is basically going to die, basically a, a slow death or a slow on the field death in terms of their careers. I, I can't. You think you think they're going to develop Caleb Williams? It doesn't matter how much talent, talent the prospect has. Like I said, I've seen better prospects ruined by inept organizations. A lot better than Keller Williams. I've seen it. So, Pittsburgh clearly wins the deal. I expect Fields will start sooner than later uh, into the season, or like early into the season, you know, late September, early, early, early October, and he is the guy that will be set to be the real heir apparent to one Ben Roethlisberger. Um, Kenny Pickett, of course, goes to the Philadelphia. It's kind of like, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, maybe he could be, you know, he has career backup written all over him. And, you know, we'll see what happens. I, like I said, that Kenny, they're not, they don't, unlike Justin Fields, the Eagles did not, um, they did not pick up Kenny, Kenny Pickett with the idea that he's going to challenge for that job. Like they're still, uh, it's still Jalen Hurts' team offense from that standpoint. So, again, I think Kenny Kenny Pickett can be a, maybe he could be a solid backup, uh, but he's not a starter. He, he's not a starting NFL quarterback. Go around the NBA a little bit. Um, Phoenix, the Phoenix Suns, all of a sudden find themselves as we speak, um, really. Uh, heading the wrong way, they are. They are now in seventh place. They are in the play-in. They are in the the, the play-in situation. That seven, that seven through ten range, a place where you don't want to be. Of course, um, they're only a half game up on the Sacramento Kings. Um, so they could finish eighth. Uh, they have they're five and five in their last ten. Phoenix, you know, I never liked this uh, top heavy uh, team with Phoenix. They just like they're too top heavy. They have you know they struggle with size, of course, 
and there just there's just too much room for error uh with the Suns. There's too much room for error. Um defensively we know that they're bad. Um all three of those guys have struggled to stay healthy at the same time. And again, I don't you know, Phoenix to me is a team that could be that could be easily a one and done. And I am not even talking about first round, it's about a play in a play in one and done. Easily. Like as a squ- as it sets up right now, Phoenix would play Sacramento in a in the play in matchup. Okay. That I mean, they <laughs> like Sacramento is a very good team. They had no answer for Sabonis. It's not a great matchup for Phoenix. And I know Phoenix has the high, you know, you got the you you had the two best players on the court in Durant and Booker, but Sacramento is a way more together team. I don't think it's enough time for Phoenix to get the amount of reps that you need as far as chemistry for them to make a serious th- a run in the playoffs. I don't. I, I just don't. And they, this is a, what I mean, this is a make or break season for Phoenix. You can't, don't, I don't want to hear, okay, in year two, it will be better with Brad, because Bradley Bill will be, have a full off season and start off healthy. First of all, Bradley Bill is never healthy. For the most part, he just the last five years. Just look, you know, look at the games played. He's never healthy. Kevin Durant's not getting any younger. He's like he'll be what thirty six next se- in September. And there has been some slippage with Durant. They had like it's, it's not again. He's putting up just you know his numbers are what they are as far as shooting, but Durant does not dominate a game, game in and game out, and. You know, he's 35 years old. He has a lot. He's been in the league since 2007. At a certain point, you're going to slip. I don't care who you are. I mean, there's been slippage from LeBron James. It's just so that they are still able to put up numbers. But they don't. those guys don't dominate the game, game in and game out like they used to, and they shouldn't. They're old. <laughs> Both of them. Still top 10 players, top 12 players, but, you know, there are other guys that, you know, Jokic or Giannis that are just more impactful at this point in their careers. So, and when you look at Phoenix, you look at uh, how many minutes Durant has to play night in and night out. Like, Durant is playing... <laughs> 37 minutes a game. 37 He's thirty five. I didn't. I didn't. He's playing thirty seven minutes a game. So you get to the playoffs, you're not going to be able to rest him down the stretch because you need to actually because you are fighting for your playoff lives from the standpoint of the playing. And again, that wear and tear will take its toll in the playoffs. Period. Like there's no there's no getting around it. So I don't trust Phoenix at all. I don't see them as a threat at all in the Western Conference. I would not be if I'm like I said. I wouldn't. Phoenix would not scare me at all if I'm if I'm if I'm one of the top teams. If I'm, it doesn't matter if I'm Denver, especially Denver. Um, Phoenix actually just doesn't you know doesn't you know just just has we see that you see the talent, but again, it is so they're so top heavy, they're so top heavy, and they. When they get the playoffs, I think they're just going to be worn down. Oklahoma, if I'm Oklahoma City, I'm not scared of Phoenix. I'm sorry. I'm at the any any of these teams at the top. Oklahoma City have a chance to get a, the number one seed. You have three teams right now. The gym, you have a chance to be the number one seed. Uh, Oklahoma City, Denver, and Minnesota all fighting for the number one seed right now. Oklahoma City and Denver are are, are in essence tied. Minnesota's one game behind. If I'm any one of those three teams. I have zero fear of the Phoenix Suns. Zero. So, Suns in trouble. New Orleans, on the other hand, is going the opposite direction as of right now. They they are eight and two in their last ten games. They are, you know, they've won three straight. They stand. They stand fifth in the uh, West, just a half game behind the Clippers. uh, As they try to get fight for that home court, you know. 
in a possible matchup with the Clippers, in a possible four or five matchup with the Clippers, which you know certainly you wouldn't always want Game Seven at your home, at your own place. New Orleans is an interesting team because you just never know which Pelicans team is going to show up. They've had some great wins, they've had some bad losses. You don't completely trust them, but Zion Zion Williamson is playing some of the best basketball of his career. They do have a lot of talent uh, with their roster. I like Willie Green as a coach. Um, Listen, they, you know, they have some veteran guys like, uh, you know, CJ McCollum's been in a number of playoff games. Balanchunas, we know, is not afraid, scared. They're an they're intriguing team, to say the least. They're very intriguing. I don't think they can get to a finals, but at the same time, if I were, you know, they, I mean, they could be interesting, to say the least. Like I said, I haven't seen enough to trust them to make a long run in the playoffs. But they are a team that could be just a pain in the ass, uh, to be honest with you, with, with the amount of talent they have. Like, you know, Zion, Brandon Ingram, Herbert Jones, McCollum. Um, you know, I'm still not quite there with them as far as, as far as I don't know. I don't think it, I don't think they're a contender. I don't think they can get out the West. Um, but in a matchup against the Clippers in the first round, who knows? Do you completely trust the? Do we completely trust the Clippers? No. No, we don't completely. We don't trust the Clippers. So, I, I think the Pelicans are an interesting team. Who again is playing? They're playing the best basketball of their career. Excuse me, best basketball of the season, and a team that. You know, frankly, if you're a number one seed, Clippers or Pelicans, you'd probably rather see the Pelican, Pelicans versus the Clippers. But I, I don't like those teams. Neither one of those teams are super scary. But you probably still would lean past, lean wanting to see um, the Pelicans versus the Clippers. Again, the good thing about the great thing about the Pelicans right now is Zion has been healthy. He's played a number. He he has he has not missed a lot of time this year. So you know, you will we will see Zion Williamson in the playoffs which should be exciting. Again, we'll talk about him later on in the podcast. So you have New Orleans and the Suns going in opposite directions. You look at the landscape of the Western Conference, uh, Dallas, Phoenix fighting for that 7-8 spot. The Lakers and, and, and Golden State jockeying between 9 and 10. Uh, listen, I think the Western Conference basically is locked in as far as the 10 teams that are going to be in the playoffs. Um, now again, Dallas, Sacramento and Dallas are going to be fighting for that last spot. Excuse me, Sacramento, Dallas and Phoenix are going to be fighting. Those three teams are going to be fighting for that last spot in terms of the top, a top six seed to avoid the plan. So you have those three teams right now. You would trust the Dallas Mavericks based on how they're playing. And Phoenix has a brutal schedule. So probably will, you know, probably will come down to Dallas and Sacramento. Um, Again, Lakers and Warriors are locked in to that knife and temp spot. They both they'll, 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 those teams will be one of those teams. Both those teams will be in that knife and temp spot, and more than likely have to play each other once again for a uh, you know a winner take all, not a, a you know lo a loser go home winner take you know a loser go home game. They're gonna have to both of them are gonna have to win two games to get to the playoffs, more than likely. Both of them are going to have to win two games to get to, to more than likely to get to the playoffs. Though it is not out of the realms of possibility with Phoenix's schedule that the Suns fall into that ninth spot. That's not out of the realms. They're two and a half games up on the Lakers, three and a half up on uh, Golden State. Western Conference does not look as formidable as it once did. When, I, when, you, when you literally look at it, Denver is Denver. OKC is still young. Minnesota is banged up. The Clippers are older. Kings, Pelicans, eh. Dallas playing well. Dallas, you know, Dallas is interesting because Dallas could be a team when you have two closers like Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. Who none of neither one of them are afraid to play afraid to play off basketball. Both of them are capable of making big plays, big shots at any time. 
Dallas could be a team that if you told me that they're in the, you know, now if you told me Dallas and the first if they play right now as it stands, they would be playing uh well if they're winning of the play in, they um Dallas would be interesting. They're in seventh right now. Let's say Dallas moves up to six for argument's sake. Move up to six. Denver is number one. Dem, you know, Minnesota is in that three, six by that'd be a dangerous that that would be a dangerous matchup for Minnesota. I think Denver would handle Dallas despite what happened on Sunday. I, I don't think I don't think Denver could beat that. Dallas could beat Denver in the first round. But Dallas versus Minnesota, Dallas versus possibly Oklahoma City, eh. Those are upset. That's upset potential. Gafford has tremendously helped Dallas. Kyrie and, and Luca are, are in a tremendous rhythm playing, you know, playing playing off each other, even though they still do the my turn, your turn thing at times. They're, st- they're playing great basketball together. Dallas could be very interesting in the, in the playoffs, to say the least. And you have a guy in Luca who has just been a menace in the playoffs. He's been a big time playoff performer throughout the course of his short career. And he can go into any series minus Denver and be the best player in that series. He probably he will outside of Denver, if he he probably is the best player uh in the conference in any playoff series, to be honest with you. Outside of Denver with Jokic. I'm going to stay with the NBA, talk about Giannis Antetokounmpo real quick. Um, did a, he did an article. There was an article in The Athletic this past week uh, or over the weekend, and Giannis is talking about his year um, and how tumultuous of a year has been, toughest year of his career. Uh, you know, we they've gone through a couple, you know, Budenhoser, you go through Adrian Griffith now with Doc Rivers, struggle with their defense. Chemistry with Damian Lillard. John is finally feeling some of that smoke of being of a championship player, of a player despite having a championship under his belt. You know, Durant, Curry, LeBron have dealt with it basically for the duration of their careers, even after they won championships. Um, and the run, and you know, Giannis is feeling that heat right now. Uh. This is not the same Giannis who came into the league, who even not even the same Giannis that we know know of that uh, that won a championship in twenty twenty one. Um, we understand that Giannis signed off on both Button Hoser and Adrian Griffith being fired. Those moves don't happen without Giannis's approval. Period. Like Giannis has his brother on the team, Giannis. You know, wanted Drew Holiday when they made that trade a couple of years ago. He wanted Dame Lillard when they made the trade this offseason. Giannis is, in essence, running that organization, which, I, you know, probably not a good thing. Considering, you know, we, we've seen that movie before with players, with LeBron, Westbrook trade. And so, you know, that's not where you want your organization. He does have that type of power, power right now. Having a phenomenal season. He's going to be all NBA. He'll finish top three in the MVP. Should be getting more consideration for MVP, to be honest with you, because he's been that spectacular. But again, he's feeling that you, you know, when you get to a point where you're a top 75 player of all time, where you're probably one of the top 20 players of all time, where you, where a situation where you are expected to win, that is a different type of smoke. Even for a guy as humble as Giannis, even for a guy as hardworking as Giannis, as likable as Giannis, that's a different smoke. And it's going to be, listen, LeBron was able to push through it, won, you know, multiple championships in, in, in Cleveland and L.A. after the Miami chips. Curry was able to push through it, wins another wins another championship without Durant. Everybody, after everybody talked about, you know, he needed Durant for two of the three, three championships, 2020, 2022, shut all that up. Durant he still has yet to answer the bell post Golden State uh, Warrior Championships, even though he was the best player on that team, even though he was the MVP. Steph winning a championship without him, and then he goes and fails in Brooklyn. You know, 
that opened up the floodgates once again to people for, for, for people to come after the uh, to come after the rent, especially what happened in Brooklyn. When you have a championship under your belt and you're considered to be an all time great, and there is extreme pressure on you to win again because of these narratives. Now you can see the narrative possibly turn on Giannis. Hey, that championship was a fluke. It happened, you know, if Kevin Durant and if, if Brooklyn would have been healthy. So that, that you know, people are going to start to come at that. It's going, you're going to start to hear fluke. If they, if they come up short, and I mean come up short, not losing to Boston in, in the conference finals, but anything less than a, a seven-game bloodbath with Boston Celtics, it's going to be a long offseason for the Milwaukee Bucks. And Giannis, more and Giannis, more importantly, because he's starting to get a little bit of criticism. Not getting heavy criticism because he's still one of the top two players in the world. But they go out in the first or second round this year. He's gonna, um, yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna feel some, start, start feeling that LeBron, you know, some of that LeBron pressure. Let's say before LeBron won his first championship. Or Durant smoke after what transpired in Brooklyn, and it'll be it'll be very interesting to see how does he handle it. Who won the week? I would say Zion Williamson. Zion Williamson is probably moving as well as he's ever moved in his career. Uh, there was a report by from ESPN's Brian Windhorst that he has apparently lost twenty five pounds. You saw him catch some alley oops, you know. Has more little spring in his step, bouncing his step as far as jumping. He's been relatively healthy this year. He, um, like I said, is playing. I think playing the best basketball of his career. Um, he's played fifty-seven games. He's going to cross that sixty-five game threshold rather easily. So uh, he will be eligible for some All NBA uh, awards and things of that nature. Um, Right now, averaging 22 points. Right now, averaging about 23 points, six rebounds, five assists. You would like to see those rebound totals higher considering his athleticism and considering, you know, his sides. Uh, shooting 58% from the field. Uh, you'd like to see the free throw percentage a little higher. Seventy percent, you know, is is kind of low for uh, kind of low for him. But regardless, he is, he catches the ball in the paint. He's absolutely unstoppable. Like absolutely unstoppable. It is almost impossible for you when he catches the ball in the paint. He's one outside of Giannis, probably the best paint player in the league. He is almost money in the paint. And again, this is as committed that we've ever seen him to his fitness. He looked like we've never seen him this committed to his fitness over the course of his career. And he's a, he's a guy in a playoff series when points are, when the points might become hard to come by. If, 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 if your threes, if teams aren't making three point shots, he could be devastating with his paint, with his points in the paint. He could be absolutely devastating in a series. And he has the talent. <laughs> he absolutely has the talent to be the best player. In a particular series, he has that ability. Now we got to see it in the playoffs, but he does have that talent. So I'm looking forward to watching him in the playoffs. Um, again, I don't, I don't see New Orleans as a title contender right now. I just don't. But you know, more importantly, they get to they get to the playoffs. This is you know this is about his development as a player, as a leader, even if you were, were to lose a first round to the Clippers six or seven games, that experience is invaluable to Zion Williamson moving forward. So we'll see what happens with that. So Zion Williamson uh, wins the week. A couple of real thoughts before I let you go. Um, Aaron Donald, of course, retired this past week. He's talking about one of the greatest players in the history of the NFL in 10 years, you will not find too many guys that have had that were great basically from down one 
until they ended their career. He had a very similar similar career to that of one Barry Sanders. Like Barry Sanders' worst year was like 1,100 yards rushing, and that's only because he missed five games because of an injury. Like Barry Sanders in, in, was basically all pro, top five offensive player year, top, you know, won an MVP in 97 along with Brett Favre. And I mean, he was doing this every single year of his career. He basically had a big time year. Aaron Donald in 10 years, eight time first team all pro. His worst year was 2022 when he only played in eight games or nine games because of an injury. But you're talking about eight times, you're talking about first team all pro, three times defensive player a year. And again, there's a lineage of, I, I think personally, he's the best defensive player since Lawrence Taylor. I really, I really believe that. As far as sheer dominance, uh, there were there were clips where they're showing like three and four dudes trying to block him, like four like four people, four offensive linemen, tight ends chipping, trying to block one guy. That's how dominant he was. And you think, like I said, you look at his his career year by year. He. Like I said, it was either defensive player of the year, top three, top five defensive player of the year, Pro Bowl, All Pro, every single year. Very few guys that ever that in the history of sports go out near at the top. He finishes finishes this year as a uh, first team All Pro again. And again, you put the quarterbacks aside, make a strong case that he over the past over the course of his career that he was the best non quarterback player in the league. A very strong case for that. Putting the quarterbacks aside. You know, you talk about the lineage of great defensive players from Lawrence Taylor. Uh, you know, when for me, going from Lawrence Taylor, like the Reggie White, uh, you know, Smith is in that category. Then you go like Deion Sanders, Ed Reed, uh, Ray Lewis, Darrell Rebus, in terms of sheer dominance. Um, yeah, I, I think Aaron Donald is certainly next, has certainly been this the most dom dominant defensive player of this generation, even more so than Ray Lewis, even more so than Ed Reed, even more so than even Deion Sanders, to be per perfectly honest with you. There is, there's, again, you can look at Deion Sanders at the end of his career. It, it did not end well uh, with, with Washington or with Baltimore. No, there were no off years for Aaron Donald. None. None. Go look at, go look at the numbers. No off years as far as from a performance standpoint. Like I said, the one off year came in 2022. That was because of injury. It wasn't because of age or because of lack of production. It's because of sheer, he wasn't, he was, he wasn't healthy. He missed, you know, he only played nine games that season. NCAA, the NCAA tournament to me officially starts. We know we got the first four, but it everything really kicks off full full throttle tomorrow. Um, UConn, big favorite, or even a favorite in the men's to go back to back. Though I don't think there's any dominant teams, including UConn, even though they were thirty one three. Um, but I would say for the first time in a long time, the more intriguing of the tournaments, the more is the women's. Like, as far as narratives and storylines, it's not even close. You're talking about they're going in with an undefeated South Carolina team. You have Caitlin Clark, who is going to have her own reporter, Holly Rowe, following her. They, I mean, they are, whew, they are milking this Caitlin Clark uh, train to death. I mean, they're milking it. They're going to get every single ounce of coverage, ratings out of this till you know till she's eliminated or when she if if, if and when she does get eliminated, they're going to milk it for all it's worth. You have the LSU South Carolina deal possible meeting that they could possibly be in the national would meet in the national championship game. Those two teams, of course, hate each other. LSU feels you know has all the confidence in the world playing playing against South Carolina. So also, there is a possibility that LSU could play in the uh, conference in the championship rematch, uh, national championship rematch against um, Purdue uh, Kate and Caitlin Clark in the regional final. So there are a lot of there are a number of big storylines in the in, in the women's tournament, not so much in the men's tournament. 
It's just not like I, I think the excitement, even the selection Sunday, did not feel the same. Like it, it just I I mean, sorry, I just couldn't get hyped over St. John's being you know left off, left off, left out of the tournament. This I just didn't do it for me, to be honest with you. So right now, women's basketball clearly, right now is is heads and shoulders above men's as far as excitement. It just is. And especially this year. Especially this year. I mean, give me the defining player in the men's game right now. Women's have, I mean, the women's have, you have Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark in the women's. Those two are signature players. Don't have that in the men's right now at all. So we are new our newest podcast to look at look for mind the game lebron james jj reddick uh they've come they've recorded two episodes and dropped one today uh or yesterday listen to the first episode you can basically skip the first seven minutes because all it encompassed jj reddick breaking down and breaking down nba plays which nobody wants to hear i'm sorry i'm just not like it just doesn't that i basically i, I turned it off through the first five, six minutes. I, I, like, like, I can't do it. Then I was like, all right, let me wait until at least LeBron starts speaking. LeBron gets on at about the eight-minute mark or so, and then things, it, it totally changed the podcast. He's popping bottles of uh, wine. He lets, you know, he starts, they start discussing uh, things like competitive greatness. They start discussing, LeBron starts discussing, you know, basketball IQ and basically having conversations about, you know, what, you know, his basketball is something that you born with or you taught. It, it that LeBron it, that is LeBron's podcast. Like I heard somebody say that JJ Reddick, you know, LeBron was smart to join up with JJ Reddick. No, no, no. LeBron did not doesn't need JJ Reddick. LeBron can find anybody to do that. That podcast is about LeBron James. You're talking about a basketball savant, talking about a basketball genius. I'm fascinated about how LeBron thinks the game or what's going through his mind. And some couple of things that stood out, you know, he hates, you know, he hates when they, um, when the execution is poor coming off a timeout, drives him crazy. I know you saw this clip go viral about the, you know, he's not a fan of the, of the, of the two for one at the end of quarters. You talked. You heard him talk about Allen Iverson, and Steph Curry. So that was a, you know, that was a LeBron podcast. That that podcast is about LeBron James. The question is to me is they're both obviously basketball fanatics and like talking the game and like talking strategy and talking about smart basketball and things like that nature. The question is me to me is how patient will those guys be if the numbers don't look like other podcasts? LeBron especially is a highly competitive guy. You don't get to you don't score forty thousand points without wanting to win. And I'm sure he wants the ratings to be as high as possible. Okay, again, I don't know how many episodes like I don't know if they're gonna be dropping weekly, bi weekly. LeBron just a, does a phenomenal job with the shop, but the shop only drops once, like maybe once a month or once every couple months. So that's a little bit different. Okay, and, and the shop is the format is completely different from the standpoint he brings in stars from all over the walks of sports and entertainment. LeBron has access to anybody. So he can come in. He can bring Drake in if he wants to. The question is, you know, the way JJ J. Reddick was talking, that this is going to be a basketball purist podcast. And I'm not sure that type of podcast is going to sell to the masses. Especially not breaking down plays. Again, no, they, if they, they talk, again, they acknowledge that they need to improve some things and it was the first episode and it, which was cool. But we don't we don't need to hear about plays being broken down the first five, four or five minutes. Nobody cares about no one, even somebody who like myself played basketball in high school. I don't care how much of a basketball nerd nerd you are. No one cares about NBA plays or about how NBA plays are run or executed. No one cares about that shit. No one, especially not a not not. In, 2024 with the attention span of fans and and people in general. So the question to me is how patient will LeBron be with his own with his own podcast? Right now, already again, the numbers are going to be there in the beginning. He has, already has 237,000 subscribers basically in what one day, two days. So he'll be that'll be at a million this time next week. I can see that right now. It's LeBron James. 
And you're talking about the biggest athlete, maybe the most popular athlete in the world right now. So, I listen. I I liked the podcast after when they when LeBron started talking and putting his input into the game, and you know how his thought process. You know, he's, you know things wondering about you know guys you see as all stars, um, in one in the first couple of years, but you don't see them again. Uh, he wants to thinks about. What happened? What happened to those guys? Why they have been? Why couldn't they be consistent all stars? It really was fascinating, you know, hearing LeBron talk about the game and speak the game. You think you know everything about LeBron, considering that he's been on the scene since basically since two thousand one. But you know, it, I, I I was kind of intrigued with it. To be honest with you, it was some things you know as far as you know basketball IQ and discussing that and what, what really i what i really got out that podcast is i uh, confirmed to me what i thought a couple of weeks ago when i was comparing eras of basketball and the reason why i say that the 90s early 90s era jordan and that that 80s to early 90s with bird magic bird and jordan was the was better slightly better than this era that's was because they the play and the players were better basketball iq fundamentals and LeBron really stated that he didn't make that particular statement, but he says basically, you know, a great player, what he's looking what's the most important thing to him is basketball IQ. Those players who went to college for three or four years, fundamentally sound, played for legendary coaches over the course of their careers, they had the type the high level of basketball IQ that players today don't have to, to a certain level because they just don't have the reps. It's not even about intelligence. This is about reps. It's about experience. It's about coaching and culture, things of that nature. It's just different. It's a different time. But that to me kind of stamped what I thought um, as far as comparing those as far as comparing eras. Like what were the two best eras that I've seen in NBA history? And I would say again, that 80s to early 90s era, slight edge over today's era. And I love today's era, to be honest with you. I love, right, the game right now, I absolutely love it. It's hard, like, like you talk about how much talent and skill set, but the ultimate, ultimate separator to me is the fundamentals and the basketball IQ that those guys had in from 80, in, you know, let's, let's say from 80 to say 1995. That's going to wrap it up for this latest edition of the Real Deal podcast. Um, of course, Sir, I'm your host, Real Gerald Quinn. I will see you next time. Um, have a great rest of your week. So long.